When it comes to pieces of media or literature that were able to just smash into the mainstream and have an enormous impact, I feel like Harry Potter is probably the one that I engage the most with besides Star Wars. The story of a boy living under a staircase who realizes that he has limitless potential in a world full of magic and gets to know like-minded individuals to form meaningful connections and friendships with was kind of fascinating for young Melon. Heck, it still is, as I'm still waiting for someone to get me out of my closet. Harry Potter actually was a sort of comfort media for me and probably many other kids who felt disconnected or alone and were just unsure about this abstract concept that we cling on to so wildly. It's of importance to me because I was able to find solace in it during a strange and indescribable part of my life which, uh, which was my parents' divorce while I was a small kid. I spent hours in Hogwarts in many ways, just trying to immerse myself in a new world that I never knew existed. I read the books, watched the films and also played the games, of which there are probably more than bad JK Rowling tweets. Uh, I, I still remember when her worst tweets were her extensions to the lore that no one asked for and I just wish it stayed that way. Like. Lady, could you go back to talking about, like, I don't know, wizards, like, making shit disappear from their pants or something? Like, this is... this is terrible. Essentially, when Rowling hit it big with the books, films and games started getting made, and for the latter, it meant a bunch of different versions on multiple consoles. So if you take a look at the Philosopher's Stone, for example, it has games on all these systems that are all distinct, which is a trend that EA kept on adhering to until what seems to be the Goblet of Fire game. That's when they just started porting the same thing to every platform. But that's not where our head is right now. Look at all this shit, I don't even have any of these consoles and games. Like, not like I could buy them because EA is just one of those companies that doesn't care about the stuff they published 20 years ago, like, actually even 10 years ago. Who likes to make extra money anyway? With all that in mind, today we're venturing into the world of my favorite childhood video games, taking a look at The Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets. In this review, I'm going to focus on the PC versions of sad games, so no PlayStation 1 Hagrid for you this time, but I'm sure I can find you something similarly intriguing. Actually, no. I don't think I can. Everything is fucked, everybody so- Upon trying to boot up each of these gems on a PC running Windows 10, you'll notice some peculiar problems. Most of which I'm going to address in this segment right now, so if you're about to take a trip down memory lane, you won't end up smashing your melon head into the table out of frustration because something just doesn't work. Some things are just not meant to be, and it's totally fine that way. <laughs> relationships. So the first problem you might encounter is that your game doesn't start. Like you're clicking on the icon and it just won't comply. It's because the DRM used to keep pirates away from cracking this bad boy doesn't work on Windows version after Vista, basically blocking the game from performing the checks required to run the game. So for my legit copies I had to use cracked exe files. It's just one of those instances in which going the extra mile to get your executives the cocaine money they already have, you'll end up fucking over the customers who bought your product. That's fine though. I'm used to it at this point. You can get a hold of these EXE files on the internet nowadays. That's step one for both games if they won't run. Step two is getting them to perform properly on a higher resolution with a tolerable frame rate. Many older games use now outdated graphical APIs or can't handle multi-core CPUs. Here I think it has more to do with the first instance. For each game there are multiple solutions for us to pick from though. The Philosopher's Stone, or the Sorcerer's Stone in the US because... I don't know, Thinking Man Boring put Magic Man in the title, yeehaw, has a wide array of fixes. If you would like to play the game on a higher resolution you can install a DirectX 11 renderer that takes advantage of modern graphics cards and also adds cool looking effects. The catch is that your frame rate is going to be limited to 30 as a means to stop audio issues and physics from going bonkers. Or you can use DG Voodoo, which is a rapper capable of emulating old graphics APIs. It's not a rapper, it's a rapper. You'll get a crisp 60 frames if you place these files in the system directory and set it up accordingly while also letting minor immersion breaking problems go like audio stuttering. <laughs> Crap. It's a choice that you'll have to make. I tried both and went with the latter as it looks better to record in 60 FPS for the sake of the video. For setting up higher resolutions there is the Harry Potter settings tool which lets you select the game you are currently tweaking and change values accordingly or you could also do it manually in the INI files located in your documents folder. This applies for both games. Also use the modify menu files so the menu is going to fit your screen on higher resolutions. I'll include the link for everything in the description. Chamber of Secrets. Um, 
I installed the DirectX 9 renderer that runs better than the DX11 one, downloaded some tweak menu files as well. The menu itself still looks a bit off, but at least fits the frame now. Just put the files in the system folder. I also used the HPS tool to change resolution and FOV in this one. This was an easier fight and required less work than getting the first one to run. Which will also require you to run it in Windows 98 compatibility mode. Seriously, said the Philosopher's Stone to Win 98 mode. That's it. You're good to run both games now. If during spell learning you encounter a bug that doesn't let you progress no matter how well you perform, set the game to software mode this way. Okay, now that's it. You can finally play these games. The question is, should you? Should you even look back at what you treasured so much in the past only to realize that your memories are heavily tainted by your nostalgia? After all... Jokes aside, there is fun to be had here, and I'm going to tell you why real quick. After a bit of... <laughs> bitching and crying like a little pissy smelly entitled baby man. We're talking about movie and book tie-ins, therefore touching on the story of the originals while making comparisons is somewhat inevitable. I feel like everyone knows at least the films, so I don't plan on going too spoiler heavy or over explaining shit when it comes to these games. I'll spoil stuff though, but not without telling you first. I'm looking out for you in this terrible world, keeping you safe from all the Richter spoilers and the Aloha Moilers. <laughs> I'm just stupid. I'm also trying to rate and critique these games as individual pieces, separated from their big screen or Big Bang counterparts. That being said, the world of Harry Potter is home to many a weird creature, paranormal apparition, and items that couldn't exist in our reality. Like frogs made out of chocolate that jump around, or frickin' jelly beans that either taste like the old school lead paint used in the Eastern Bloc, or hey, choco bananas. Not to mention the moving statues, talking paintings, and witch bikes you don't need a license for. <laughs> There are a lot of elements to unpack when it comes to the world and its quirks. That's why it's odd how the Philosopher's Stone doesn't give you too much to learn about. It essentially approaches the player as someone who is already familiar with the franchise and does not make a conscious effort in explaining its world away. This is also a problem on the story front. Harry Potter 1 follows the story of... Uh... Wait a second. Let me see... Uh... Giuseppe Stromboli. Stop this instant, or I will contact my attorney. Harry Potter is actually an Italian American. He is not. Giuseppe Stromboli and the briefcase of Meatball. Giuseppe Stromboli, who realizes that he has a magical heritage and has been invited to the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft, where tons of wacky adventures unfold as Harry gets to know like-minded individuals and finds his purpose as a young man who gets caught up in a conflict that's a lot bigger than he is, in the focus of which is a magical MacGuffin. The source of Philosopher's Stone. The original story places Harry in a completely new environment that is almost like a dream come true for him. A school of wizards is a beautiful escape for him from the abusive Dursleys. Hogwarts, however, is also a place where his fame will occasionally thrust him into unpleasant situations. It's a nice setup for the typical childhood hero who you would want to become while staring away into the fields behind your yard. Why did I... Smack the microphone. And the first installment is already full of a lot of character-defining moments for Harry, meaning that following his development and recreating his story in a video game would be the important part of the equation. From the get-go, Harry Potter once set me up for a bit of a strange experience. After just way too much tinkering, my expectations got really high and I was ready to experience the story of Mr. Stromboli once again in an interactive manner. If you plan on doing the same, however, you might get a bit disappointed as, 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 as the thinking man's stone was adapted in a disjointed way that has what I call tie-in logic behind it. The game takes key elements of the story so they carry you through the experience in a way that feels similar to a checklist. Oh yes, uh, the troll. Um, yeah, Quidditch. Uh, Oh yeah, that, that guy, that, that Professor K K K K Skurus Vulgaris. There are small segues occasionally, but you're not going to get a detailed introduction to Hogwarts or the characters. Look, it's, a, it's Santa Man! I mean, aside from the short little overture in the beginning, which already is a paraphrased version of the film and the book's intro. Unfortunately, 
The same applies to the game's ending as well. The game's story is incomplete and functions more as a companion piece to the media it's based on. It just feels a bit more simplified than it should be, and the result of that is that sometimes you just won't know who the characters you're talking to are and why they are significant. I mean, everyone knows the main trio, and I guess Dumbledore, Hagrid, Dicko Bradfoy as well, but that's it. If you think with a parent's head in the early 2000s who's looking for a game to buy for their child, this could have ended up with a kid who knows nothing about Harry Potter, let alone Giuseppe Stromboli. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. That's because the game came out on the same day as the first film. Even tying games had the chance to become someone's first exposure to a piece of media at the time, therefore you would want the experience to be complete in itself. I know this sounds really weird because tying games kinda died out, maybe some of you have never even played one at all. It's a tendency that I don't really miss, but there were some occasional gems here and there. However, when it comes to how these games portrayed the story of the source material, Sometimes they ended up with interesting solutions, like in the case of this one. Certain elements of the story are just simply presented without much build-up because the sequences that would usually connect story beats are simplified and vaguely explained, or not explained at all. The story's pacing and execution feels rushed, even though it shows knowledge and understanding of the world. As the devs paid attention to and incorporated details that you would only know about if you read the book. They took spells from the source material and even included a little sequence where Harry helps in smuggling Hagrid's dragon out of Hogwarts, which only gets a throwaway line in the film. They weaved all these little moments into the story, but I feel like some extra exposition could have been nice for the players, so they can get to know the characters more. You don't get to know anyone in a meaningful way that would make you understand a bit more. It's a lot of world repeats, you idiot. Sometimes I feel like events just happen for the sake of them happening. I'm gonna show you some parts and describe what I mean by saying that the storytelling is a bit flawed. So, skipendo to the section of the video or Wingardium levitate yourself there. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Lots of stuff. Not that much, but still a lot. All right then. Spoilero! Some arcs have been simplified. Like the whole ordeal with Snape, who the gang believes to be the antagonist of the story, and he's just relegated to a potion class where he's just being a mean dumb dingus man, like he usually is. Also one part where he leaves the Forbidden Corridor wounded, it's enough for the gang to be suspicious about him potentially being the one who tries to steal the Philosopher's Stone, which is required for a potion of eternal life. Cute little MacGuffin. The game's simplicity in this regard could be chalked up to the fact that it is indeed a kid's game. I get it, but I do think that this rendition of the story is way too simple and loses a few elements that would give a lot more insight. My problem with the structure is that it occasionally just lets you know about things instead of building them up, which results in a lot of sudden revelations, like the stone itself just gets casually researched by the gang, and they just know that it has to be in the Forbidden Corridor because something growled there. Not to mention how casually they mention how Hagrid delivered a package from Gringotts to Hogwarts. The package was, of course, the stone itself, but <laughs> good to know that that just happened. <laughs> the structure being a tad bit off is why I think the story itself is told in a rough manner. The final encounter with Wee Man, therefore, doesn't hit us hard because, yeah, Snape's strange and all, but do I know enough to confirm that he's the bad guy? I'm not being terribly misled, just like how Rowling intended in the book by bait and switching me with Quirrell. Voldemort's revelation, however, is traumatic in its presentation, and I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> His boss fight is clever too as it requires mechanical know-how and a bit of finesse, using an important mirror from a story perspective in the middle of the room to send his attacks right back to him. Unfortunately, it's a bit janky and sometimes his projectiles burst through the spinning piece of introspective glass, but it's not that hard to pull off. The ending cutscene being a narrated slideshow is underwhelming and I wish there was more. At least you'll get to know what Fred and George were working on all this time. Honestly, these are all my problems with the story of Philo Rock. That's... that's it. Skipendo! You can come back now, I don't want to waste too much of your time meandering about differences between source material and adaptation because I feel like it would result in a lot of unnecessary harshness and me spoon-feeding a bunch of unimportant nonsense. I don't like to put down creative projects and labors of love, even if they are flawed. Especially when the devs understand how and what to improve in the next installment of a series. Which is exactly what happened in the case of Chamber of Secrets. 
It's almost strange how Chamber of Secrets takes a more focused approach to the source material when it comes to presenting its world, further showcasing how the first game was probably hella rushed. The second one gives you a lot more exposition from the get-go, detailing a lot more plot points through cutscenes, introducing important characters early on and utilizing actual foreshadowing, which is important in the context of the story, effectively utilized foreshadowing at that. Compared to its predecessor, it works beautifully on its own. Even if the player hasn't read the books, the story has a clear and easy to follow structure and the characters have considerably more chemistry. There are actual characters in this one compared to the cardboard cutouts of Philosopher's Stone. Before that lecture, I thought I knew everything I wanted to about Flobber One Mucus and I was right. While both stories will lead you through the everyday lives of Harry, Ron and Hermione as they attend classes and learn new spells, this one makes a conscious effort to familiarize you with the world of Harry Potter. You don't just run to classes without having a hint of knowledge about who these people are. You'll learn about what fuels Draco Malfoy's rivalry with the gang and all the terminology that's part of the series lexicon. This is where the main differences lie. Chamber of Secrets effectively stands on its own and tells its story in a cohesive manner, even if it's a bit rudimentary and simple when it comes to conveying it. I don't know! I found him like this! Follow me, E. Potter. I keep forgetting that this is a kid's video game and I shouldn't be too harsh when it comes to reviewing something that wasn't intended for a strictly adult audience, I get that. And to be perfectly honest, it's still a fun story to run through. Chamber of Secrets of course tells the story of Harry Potter once again who travels back to Hogwarts for another school year, where a series of unusual incidents take place. Attacks, where all that remain are the petrified bodies of the victims, which sparks Harry and the gang to start investigating the attacks, leading them to a long-forgotten villain that resides in the school. It's, uh... <laughs> you could say it's kind of a... Resident Evil. <coughs> Compared to the first one, it flows a lot better and is a lot more engaging, not to mention how it builds up specific scenes quite effectively. The care put into the world building and storytelling is a lot more apparent, even if some scenes end up feeling a bit stiff and artificial. But in a way, that's kind of an early 2000s staple. I would say. I haven't talked about voice acting that much throughout the two games. There are instances of genuinely good and god awful. Good morning, Harry! It's time for our Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson with Professor Lockhart. I just love his books. He's such a brilliant writer. Harry's voice acting in the first one is grinding on my fucking nerves simply because of how every time he casts a spell, he just screams his brains out like an underage hardcore punk waiting for his balls to drop. I have a spell for whoever thought that was a good idea. Slipendo! Slipendo! Just kidding, this is a classy show, he says after writing for jokes that you haven't heard yet. Chamber of Secrets ditches Harry's original voice actor and brings in a kid who's a bit more chill, but talks a lot more compared to the previous installment where most of the dialogues between the group are narrated and this is a nice enough change of pace that makes conversations feel more natural, even when the voice acting is iffy. How does the game's story improve? I'ma tell you. The spoilers are coming once again and I'm trying to give you my brief, brief thoughts on this bad boy. You ready? Spoilero! Chamber of Secrets story is conveyed in a more deliberate and thought out way. Sometimes even trying to scare the player and succeeding at it. Creating a spooky and mysterious atmosphere is kind of the forte of this game, not to mention how it effectively includes a bunch of cinematic bits that are incredibly cool. This overall cinematic feel is persistent throughout the game. If you're familiar with the story, you understand how there is essentially a big-ass basilisk living inside the pipeline of the school, whose gaze turns every unsuspecting victim into stone. The journey to that revelation, however, leads you through horrifying spider lairs and encounters with a big fuck-off one named Aragog, who used to be Hagrid's pet at the time, and is basically the one who everyone considers to be the culprit. The spider story arc is foreshadowed multiple times during your playthrough, as they just keep strutting about whenever something bad has happened. It's kind of subtle because they're just they're just running around, dude. I have no bad intentions, sir, other than biting your bitch ass. Ah! There is a bait and switch throughout that builds up Malfoy to be the potential culprit, as the heir of Slytherin is apparently the one responsible and every enemy of theirs should tremble. You even get to investigate that narrative thread when you turn into Goyle, one of Malfoy's dingus friends, using a special potion. Harry's parcel tongue ability he can talk to snakes. And his communication with the basilisk still kinda gets to me, like you can feel this ancient evil crawling around you but can't tell where exactly, and your descent into the chamber looks incredible. 
culminating in a rather simple but fun boss fight against the Basilisk where you use a sword sent by Dumbledore to shoot the fucker with big spell balls. The snake of course is controlled by Tom Riddle, whose journal was a key item in opening the chamber and letting the Basilisk loose. You can probably imagine how Ginny Weasley got a hold of it and became a puppet for Riddle, also known as Voldemort to control. I went into more detail compared to Philosopher's Stone because you can see all this happening. It's conveyed and foreshadowed really subtly. There's a lot more to unpack and pay attention to, and I think this game's rendition of Chamber of Secrets story is a lot more rewarding to blaze through, especially as a kid because noticing all the little details was kind of mind-blowing for me at the time. I played this one before engaging with any kind of Harry Potter media, so honestly it was a really engaging note to start out with, and I love this story really. It actually became my favorite uh, Harry Potter story, I mean Chamber of Secrets in general. It's my favorite Harry Potter, it's my favorite Giuseppe, I, I think that's it. Skipendo! I'm back! In terms of atmosphere, world building and story, Chamber of Secrets just blows the first one out of the water. I like both, don't get me wrong, but the improvements and the extra care to solidify the foundation set in Philosopher's Stone worked wonders in the case of the second installment. Its characters feel a lot more fleshed out and the storytelling received a substantial upgrade. The atmosphere is more immersive and untangling this spooky little story was a bit more fun. More fun being a statement that's also fitting for the gameplay side of things. Wow, what a segue. Philosopher's Stone is the first Harry Potter game on PC. Just believe me without looking it up, please. It kickstarts a series of adaptations, therefore its main job is to set up the gameplay foundation for potential sequels to tweak, right? Kinda. I gotta say, this is probably the biggest accomplishment of P-Stone in my book. The developers have created a really simple system when it comes to using magic spells. The game enters aiming mode when you hold down the left mouse button, stopping you dead in your tracks. Most in-game objects can be interacted with using a compatible spell. Alohomora can open doors and locks, Incendio can kill angry plants, Lumos creates transparent glowing platforms for you to jump on, and Vingardium Leviosa lifts shit up. There is also the non-canon flipendo made up by the devs which pushes things and works as your primary attack. Unless your opponent is an ugly spiky plant. Forget that, plants are cool. If you learn the spell, its symbol will show up on a compatible object when you're aiming at it. Letting go of the left mouse button will result in Harry casting the spell and something usually happens when you do that. Unless you don't know any spells or don't have an object to interact with, then you just perform the magical equivalent of a fart. This is what you're doing in these games. I mean, aiming at stuff and casting spells at anything you can, not farting. Its implementation, however, changes drastically between the two games, as the sequel lets you cast spells while moving around. Not to mention how it revamps some of the spells and introduces new ones, giving them more mechanical depth. Spells are incredibly simple in the first installment and the way they are utilized is not too abstract. Kids will figure all that shit out real quick. Even though you can lift up big stones, fly on witch taxis and push stuff aside, Variety, in the spellcasting department, really isn't the game's biggest strength, as its magic mechanics are limited. It's especially sad in the case of Vingardium Leviosa because I feel like not much has been done with it besides placing blocks on pressure plates. They are still satisfying to use and I enjoyed exploring Hogwarts 1.0 just as much as 2.0. Even though spells are a bit one-dimensional, they are fun to use and satisfying because you always get a bit of instant gratification whenever you do something. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yes! 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 Chamber of Secrets doesn't deviate and innovate too much on this front, but introduces enough variety so that the limited toolset serves a lot more purposes. Rictus Semper joins forces with Flipendo, as most of the combat will involve using the former to stun the enemy and the latter to push it onto pressure plates. Sometimes you only gotta use Rictus Semper to immobilize a creature. You gotta do that a lot though, because Chamber of Secrets is arachnophobia the video game and I don't even wanna look at these fuckers. Combat isn't all that engaging in either of the games, but it spices up platforming and provides a bit of extra variety. We're not talking about difficult experiences with that many terrifying monsters anyway. Alongside Rictus Empra, Scourge comes in, which removes ectoplasm from any surface, letting you traverse without getting hurt. Defindo takes the role of Incendio and Spongify creates jump pads that improve the verticality of platforming while also helping you pull off huge ass jumps. These look and feel wonderful and are thrown into platforming just when you would become tired of it. Also, Lumos serves both as a light and an opener for hidden doorways as well, illuminating paths through walls. It's a kid's game, therefore hidden rooms and compartments are telegraphed really well and both games make a conscious effort in teaching you how the usual secret door looks like. Both are incredible at teaching you game logic at a young age, I think, with their secret-heavy approach facilitating exploration. 
The first one is more straightforward than linear in this department, not giving you too much space to explore and always offering you all the necessary tools required to find what you're looking for, as you don't really have the means to go back to a specific area. While Chamber Boy has slight Metroidvania elements to it, utilizing layered obstacles you can only pass by learning new spells, essentially making you come back for more later on when you're more prepared. The environment is also a lot more open, with Hogwarts being available almost all the time for you to plunder all the beans and wizard cards. Beans are currency that can buy you wizard cards from Fred and George, and also some extra potion materials in the second game from random people. Random people sell you shit in the second game in general. These two make for healing potions at the steaming cauldrons located in Hogwarts. Wizard cards have a small impact on the ending of the first game, but besides that, there aren't many reasons for you to collect them. Chamber of Secrets sort of approached them from a new angle though, setting up free tiers in the process. Bronze ones give you an extra health bar and silver ones give you a key every time you collect 10 of them. Having all the silver ones opens the gold tier, which is just a collectible filled bonus room stuffed with cool looking cards. Even if you don't want to go for the gold ones, the incentive to collect them will already be there thanks to the actual benefits you get for doing so. Not to mention that you can spend the overabundance of beans you collected on ones you missed in areas that are only accessible once. You could also buy Quidditch accessories from Fred and George in Harry Potter 2 that make you faster and more resistant to damage. Both games have Quidditch with different implementations. HP 1's rendition is essentially a chase for the snitch, accompanied by a simple timed catch mechanic. While HP 2 is about keeping the enemy seeker away from the snitch by kicking and beating them viscerally while you stay on it. I like both approaches as they make for bite sized little detours during all the uh. I actually slightly prefer the first installment's Quidditch as it is way more engaging and gives you more control than just following the fucker on rails. Movement is crucial in both and behaves differently as well. Chamber of Secrets lets you strafe which makes movement feel a lot more responsive compared to the tank controls of Philosopher's Stone. Both have a lot of platforming and in terms of how responsive they feel there is a difference in approach once again. HP1 feels a bit slower due to its, again, tank controls and weightier jumps. Not to mention how Harry only hangs on to a ledge in the last second or so. It feels a bit stiff, but the game's obstacles and levels are designed around this system wonderfully and the devs never force you to make a shitty leap of faith jump or to pull a stun that's barely possible. The second game feels a lot snappier with different states that Harry can pull himself up from and generally faster and more polished controls and movement. It was really weird at first to jump with right click, but it works pretty well and it's quite comfortable actually. However, you're not only gonna just like jump around. Sometimes you gotta be a thinking man. That's why you're in school, bucko. Puzzles tend to solve themselves as you're only required to activate switches or move stuff around, but they are cohesively integrated into the level design and don't feel like something that's way too gamey. Well, for the most part. Also, I'm gonna take my time and applaud the Hogwarts board of teachers who put together the curriculum for the school year because I like how every class's material builds on top of each other, requiring students to utilize what they already mastered in previous classes, even in the new spell challenge rooms. Every new spell is learned in a challenge room by accumulating a high score by collecting challenge stars. As I said previously, these will give you a specific amount of score which will then be added to your house points. Every teacher has one of these challenge rooms and I'm surprised how they weren't fired for being idiots who put you next to the dangerous ghosts and haunted rooms. <laughs> also, the way the first game is structured, it literally feels like every lesson is on the same day. It's 3am and my charms lesson is starting, I haven't slept for 32 hours now, please send help! I also like the competitive spirit of the house rivalry because it rewards the best and doesn't punish the worst. Also, the rewards are really neat, offering a metric fuckton of beans to plunder. You can also duel in Chamber of Secrets which essentially boils down to deflecting, attacking and making your enemy incapable of casting spells for a short while. And it always turns into spell ping pong that lets you get a hold of a wide array of beans. In Harry Potter 1 learning spells starts with drawing a symbol. It's kind of ambitious but a bit stiff to do precisely with a mouse. I still prefer it over the overly simplified not even rhythm game vibe of pressing the correct arrow key when the wand hovers over it gameplay of the second one. Enough said. Overall, I think the gameplay loop is satisfying in terms of both games, offering a variety of different mechanics that are rather simple. I do think some extra magic variety could have benefited either of the two, but honestly, it's a lot of fun to just shoot spells at stuff to see all the colorful, good-looking beans spill out when you enter the bonus room and collect all the beans because you were a cool guy 
who aced his classes and you deserve all the good looking beans. Not just the beans are good looking, games are good looking too. I especially love the colorful nature of Hogwarts and how many intricate details have been added to the environment to make it stand out. I especially love the staircase in the second game with flying stairs connecting multiple floors with walls full of paintings with no free space whatsoever. The effects look incredible in both for the time, with open chests jumping around as your Alhamora hits and the small magic bits flying out of your wand as you're waving it around. <laughs> I'm a dirty, dirty man. <laughs> Sorry about that. There is a vivid... That was a vivid image. <laughs> there is a vivid atmospheric charm to every room in these games. A lot of care was put into making the visuals stand out, not to mention how they were able to replicate some of the scenery from the films which were in production alongside the games. Some faces can look interesting, Ron kinda scares me and in the second game people learn how to use their mouths. Not having a mouth never stopped Malfoy from not shutting the fuck up. But let's change the subject to something that you would actually like to listen to, the soundtracks. These games have Jeremy Soule soundtracks, do I need to say anything else? You won't hear the distinct and beautiful John Williams theme, but don't let that discourage you. Jeremy Soule wrote a lot of dreamy atmospheric songs for both games. The Hogwarts entryway theme has been stuck in my head for almost 20 years now and it won't be leaving anytime soon. alongside the beautiful main menu cut of Chamber of Secrets. Heavily underrated soundtracks that reuse some cuts, but oh my god. Probably the prettiest uses of a piano I've ever heard in a video game. Well, if, if we don't count Silent Hill 2. It dances between playful, magical and spooky so effectively with different instrumentals that are just mind-boggling. Every encounter with Fred and George, for example, comes with this goofy jingle that is tongue-in-cheek, sort of referencing the duo's prankster tendencies. And then you move on and the game hits you with something like this. Lots of deep bassy melodies with tense strings that really terrified me as a child and I'm still absolutely in love with them to this day. Even the more subdued cuts are like, beautiful. I, I just love Soul's piano work, to be honest. Quality looks, sounds, I'm biased and I'm out of words. I'm not a good writer. I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not a poet. Also, I love how everything sounds crisp and cartoony. I, I, I can just hear the beans jumping out of chests and spongify tiles bouncing me up. It's, it's, it's just cute. And to sum it up, both are satisfying and cute little adventures on their own that utilize a lot of different mechanics to create a unique combination of gameplay. Platforming, puzzle solving, and shooting? Technically it's shooting. If I had to rate the overall game feel, I enjoy Chamber of Secrets a lot more as every element of it is more polished and well realized, which is a statement that is essentially true when describing the entire game compared to its predecessor. I'm not going to dunk on Philosopher's Stone because its foundations made it possible for Chamber Boy to run. Both are beautiful in terms of visuals and sound design as well. The story of HP2 of course benefited from more time and extra care that unfortunately the first one couldn't get. Maybe that's also an EA problem, among the many terrible things that we can like attribute to EA. It was fun reliving my memories with these games though, running around hallways I never actually set foot in but still know like the back of my hand. When, when did I get that burn mark? It also reminded me of stuff that I didn't want to think about. But I also slowly realized how all this is behind me and doesn't affect me all that much anymore, so that's a plus. I can wholeheartedly recommend both games if you'd like to relive your memories, or just wanna dive headfirst into stuff you missed out on, but be aware of the technical difficulties that you might come across. As always, thank you for watching the video. If you liked it, I appreciate the YouTube engagement stuff like subbing, liking, disliking, whatever. Do it! I, I appreciate any kind of feedback. Also, please, if you're like subbed or if you're like thinking about it, hit the bell because people told me they don't get notifications on my stuff and that kind of helps with that. Thank you again. Next time we're committing gnome genocide in Arcanum while making banana bread. See ya!